are changes. First of all, the reasons for reform. Here's where we have themes. And you think about with writing an essay, um, and it, why did we have this change over time? All right, the progressive movement. The first one was to protect social welfare. I kind of think if you are to write an essay about progressive movement, I've kind of given you categories right here. And some of these pictures might even show it. We have child labor that's going on. Okay, so we want to try to protect people. Uh, we're going to have one of the most influential books in American history with Upton Sinclair in the jungle, okay, that we want to try to protect people. Promote moral improvement. One thing that would happen in the progressive movement would be the 18th Amendment. What did the 18th Amendment do? Prohibition. Prohibition. Yeah, prohibition. Is that making laws about morality? No alcohol. Yeah, no alcohol. Okay, and said, what well, this is where one group, all right, is telling other groups that no, you can't drink. All right, this is where for moral. Uh, but we're gonna go deeper into that. Foster efficiency. This one's the one that seems weird. Remember we had Taylorism? And the idea that we're going to, to look around and that Frederick Taylor would make things. Well, here's where Henry Ford would go with this. And he would make the assembly line, make it more efficient. Okay, And there are things that we we're doing in the progressive movement today. And the last thing is economic reform. We have problems that we can. The 1800s, we kept having these panics. The Panic of 1807, the Panic of 1819, the Panic of 1837, the Panic of 1853. Okay, we kept having these times that we would go into it. Well, we wanted to try to fix that going up and down and up and down economically. All right, the sources for reform. Here's where we take things from the past and put it put in here. Some things are worldwide. Anyone ever heard of Karl Marx? What, when you see or hear Marx, what one word should you think of? Communism. Yeah. Well, Marx, but communism. Okay. He wrote the Communist Manifesto. And the whole idea that he wrote about was we have this great disparity between our very rich and our poor, our workers and in the factories and the people that own it. We would have changes that would come about in our World War I game. Who was Russia? Where are they going now? Okay, what happened to poor little Russia? It got taken over. Yeah, well, they, they became the Soviet Union. So, um, but that's where we would have these changes worldwide. Some of these changes would take place in America, but not to that extreme. Some people, and this is where you can actually have a thesis statement when it comes to the progressive movement, is we were making changes, but we did not go as radical as the communist movement. Um, was Teddy Roosevelt a smaller version of Lenin? And you can kind of look and see. What did he do to make sure that, that we did not totally overthrow all the people that were rich and powerful, but we did some of that curve it? Um, the income differences from the Industrial Revolution. <coughs> the average worker and the 1890s, I can't remember what year it was, but, but the average worker was making about $500 a year at the same time that Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan and Carnegie were all making millions of dollars. So we have a huge disparity, uh, more so than we have today. Remember the labor unions? This is where some, some of that helps feed into it. I'm uh, not going back into detail over the labor unions. The Knights of Labor would start things. Um, in the AFL, when in doubt, the AFL is around. We will have the IWW, International Workers of the World, that will that is coming to power at this time. They would end up dying out, though, after World War I. African-American groups wanting changes. Booker T. Washington making the Tuskegee um, Institute. But more so would be with W.E. Du Bois and the Niagara Movement. What would the Niagara Movement later on become? What letters should you remember? Right, the NAACP. Okay, NAACP. And this is where Du Bois was saying, we need equality. 
right? And where Booker T. Washington was one when going steps, all right? I, the boys was like, no, it should be we're equal automatically, all right? There is no steps towards there. Here's where we get to some of the biggest changes and then the reaction to it. We have a lot of immigrants coming in. Remember our new immigrants. All these people coming in from Italy, coming in from Greece, coming in from Russia. Some people were, how are we going to change? Now, some of this was, how are we going to help them to adjust to America? But are some people saying, how can we make them American? We don't want to have their Russian influence, their Italian influence. We want to make them like us. And again, you kind of convert, whenever you're thinking of the immigration, you can kind of look and see when we have nativism, whether the time period is today or whether it was 100 years ago. What was one of the reasons for the 18th Amendment to ban alcohol? <coughs> Do Italians ever drink anything? No. <laughs> Anyone ever been to an Italian wedding? <laughs> So do you think maybe where we had some Protestants that didn't believe in drinking, would that maybe be a way to curb some Italians and make them more American? All right, for those new immigrants, that's where some of these changes came about there. All right, now for more. Media, increase in newspapers and magazines. During the late 1800s, we, we got cheaper ways to make paper. Newspapers were able to be sold at a very cheap price. You could then spread stories. We will have yellow journalism, but we will also have the investigating reporter and what the term that you're going to get used to, muckrakers. They're going to write about things that are wrong um, in society. Books are cheaper. Remember the political machines, the great exciting Gilded Age. Boss Tweed, Tammany Hall. Well, we have some of the reaction to that. And not just the Democrats with Tammany Hall. We have the stalwarts, um, half-breeds of the Republicans. Um, some of you might remember with the, the mugwumps. All right, those are Republicans that were looking for anybody that was honest in the Democratic Party and how Grover Cleveland gets elected. There. The Populist Party would, have, would end up coming about somewhat because of changing this. But that is where, before I say this is kind of a connection to our last section. Who's in that political cartoon? Yeah, that's Boss Tweed. Okay. All right, social Darwinism. Anybody remember social Darwinism? What is it? Uh, well, what's social Darwinism? The strongest company. All right, the strongest company. Does that mean that then Carnegie and Rockefeller should be able to do whatever they want? Yeah. All right, can they crush anybody that's in their way? Some people disagreed with that idea. Uh, we'll also have some disagreement with social Darwinism. I don't have it up here, but when it came to races, because we also had social Darwinism where some people believe that some races were superior to other. That's where our imperialism comes in. So this is where the boys and these kind of things kind of start getting intertwined a little bit with each other. Our post-Civil War boom and bust. All right, the economy going up and down, up and down. All right, now here's one of the most forgotten things where I kind of threw it in at, at one of the sections in um, Panic of 1893. Anybody remember what Coxey's army, what they were demanding? Um, the pay? Well, not pay, but the government to create jobs. Yeah, government to create jobs. Today we call it a stimulus package. But a lot of unemployed workers went to Washington, D.C. as an army, not a true army, but they were saying, you need to do things to create jobs. We need to build dams, build roads, and basically make jobs. Um, at that time, people looked at it and said, no, it's not government's job. And by the time we get to the Great Depression, though, that, that idea would change. And here's where you actually look and see. And you look at a graph on here. Well, that's a public land sale, so that's the only one that I have. Um, but that's kind of the way the economy was up and down and up and down. All right, last thing, the income gap. We have our robber barons that are extremely wealthy. The people living in the tenement houses. Okay, just I mean, a room this size, you might have a family of 20 people living in it. But don't worry, you get to share the bathroom with three other families on that floor. 
Okay, so yeah, you get, you get close with everybody. But we have that extreme change um, that we have with each other. All right, I have a question that says, how are the populists and progressives alike? And I know that's a little bit fuzzy for, for where I tried to expand that out. Um, here. The populists come about before the progressives, William Jennings Bryan. And there were a lot of things that the populists were encouraging that the progressives would end up adopting. Some by Democrats, some by Republicans. And it's something that ends up happening a lot of times in America where we have third parties come about that the other parties were adopted. Now, first of all, we have who are the people that make up the progressives? Farmers, factory workers, um, small business owners, college educated, middle and upper class there. Meanwhile, with the populace, you have farmers, factory workers, small business owners. So what group do you see in both, both categories? Yeah, the farmers and factory workers. Kind of look at that and kind of say maybe you're a regular working people. Meanwhile, the popul the progressives end up getting some of the middle and upper class also involved. So that's how they're a little bit different with who they had involved. The progressives were urban based. The populists were agrarian based. And this is where we'd end up having some of the changes. Now, we will have a populist party. Um, our first candidate will be a guy by the name of Teddy Roosevelt after he's been president. But our most famous populist will be another guy, um, Robert LaFolliette, even though he may not be the most famous candidate, but he would happen. Um, the progressive says each group had its own issues, such as government reform. Meanwhile, the populists were dealing with tariff. Um, they wanted to the change and make uh, money and make and major issues, remember the area of bimetallism. Um, progressives, some success at state and local levels. The populist issues co-opted by major parties. So this is where we see a difference that we would have. The populists ended up dying out because Republicans and Democrats ended up stealing their issues. And Meanwhile, the progressives actually stay more, and they end up, like states like Wisconsin, we're going to find, end up electing some of the, more of the progressives. All right, now we get, get through to muckrakers. What's muck? Mud. Dirt. Mud, dirt. So what is a, what is a muckraker doing? Yeah, they're stirring up, they're going through, they're raking through. I mean, I kind of think of it as someone, if you're working in a stable, okay, and you get that mud that has a lot of other things in it besides just mud, and you're cleaning out the stable or a barn. And this is where Teddy Roosevelt, he did not say it affectionately. Although, have you ever had it where someone says something for an insult that you kind of take it as a badge of honor? And that's what ended up happening, because... Because um, Teddy Roosevelt was talking about these people, they're just stirring up trouble. But they looked at things and said, oh, this is okay, we're, we're exposing the wrongdoings. Now, it's kind of weird today to look at. McClure's and Collier's are still around today. What do those magazines deal with today? Are they like the little inquiries? They're what? They're, are they like not real? They're, yeah, they're more tabloids, actually. They're, they're women's magazines, but it's kind of, when you look at today, it's, it's an almost, I mean, it'd be like different, it's not as bad as Cosmopolitan, okay? It's like a tamer version of Cosmopolitan, okay? But they might have stories of 10 ways to satisfy your man, all right, what is so-and-so getting pregnant? So they're kind of tabloids. But at that time, they weren't. They wrote exposés. What is an expose? Exposing? Oh, yes, exposing. Notice that. You're exposing. And what are they exposing? The wrong. Yeah, the wrongdoings. Um, and we would have the writers that were doing that. Now, here's where we go through some of the books. And you'll recognize some of these books are from our, our last section. Sister Carrie. Now, this one actually wasn't so much. This is where we have the realism style of literature that's being written. Um, but he wrote about how a lot of single women, when they moved to the cities, and the problems that they would have. 
<coughs> Here are some of the books that really made a huge difference, though. And notice I have these in bold and underlined um, with the name. Shame of the City and How the Other Half Lives. What were both of them about? Yeah, the poor people, tenement houses, things that are bad in the cities. What the other half, how the poor people was. Now, with Jacob Reese, the thing that really makes it with him is not only did he write a book, he then also went it with what else? Pictures. Yes, a lot of pictures. Came about with photography and would come in and take pictures. And this is where he would come to some of the, to the richer people and he would present them with a slideshow. This is where we had a real disconnect sometimes. Um, do you think some, some people that are like multimillionaires have any idea of how you live? No. Well, what if that gap was even bigger? And that's the way it was at that time period. When you have someone that is just so rich, do they realize, I mean, anybody ever been to the Biltmore Estate in North Carolina? That's one. I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, Vanderbilt built that. That was one of his many homes. Okay, an incredible mansion. Spent very little time there. Um, Meanwhile, I mean, again, he has this estate, this giant mansion, and these gardens, and all this beautiful area, and he just spends a little time there. Meanwhile, you've got people living in tenements. So when you had Jacob Reese comes in and shows a slideshow and shows these pictures of, I mean, children living in, I mean, true filth and squalor, okay, and that visual would make a difference for it. Um, okay. Last bit that we'll do uh, some others here, though. Ida Tarbell, put stars by her name, put arrows by her. This is a woman who wrote a book, The History of the Standard Oil Company. All right, it's against monopolies, but when you see Standard Oil Company, what person should you be thinking of? Rockefeller. Yes, Rockefeller. And later on, this, the United States would actually press charges and would have a court case against John D. Rockefeller uh, that he do practices that were illegal and with Standard Oil Company. Was he done He was guilty of certain things. They made him disband the company, <coughs> which ultimately he made even more money because we had companies like from when Standard Oil was broke up, we would have almost all the major oil companies you think of today with Chevron, Exxon, those type of companies where we broke it up. He actually ended up making more money after it broke up. Uh, we found that out a couple different times. When AT&T was broken up in the 1970s, and we would have all the different Bell companies go on their own. We have Bell South here. We have a little company called Verizon that spun off of it. Okay, And they actually ended up becoming, I mean, even bigger after they were broken up. Now, what's wrong with monopolies? Why? Why is she writing a book saying that monopolies are wrong? Because you can charge outrageous prices. And that's yeah. part of it. And you can charge whatever price you want. In the case of the Standard Oil Company, when people needed kerosene, they had no choice to basically buy what Rockefeller made. And it's not only prices, but how about quality? Yeah, if there's no competition, is there any reason to make a higher quality? Why is it that iPhones keep getting better and better? Because the droids keep getting better and better. <coughs> if there was nothing but either droids or iPhones, would they keep improving so rapidly? Because there would be any reason? I mean, Apple already just releases a new thing no matter what, but just a few changes, all right, because the Apple lights will go buy anything that's a new Apple. Okay, but they, but they are having to keep improving along the way. Um, yeah, but that's without a tar belt. All right, the other big one to know is Upton Sinclair. He wrote the book, The Jungle. Now, you may remember what caveat impor means. Buyer yeah, the buyer beware. He challenged that idea of to the buyer beware. Um, and he wrote about how in the meatpacking industry, when they were grinding up the meat, and I, I always just have these images uh, the part when, when he wrote on there, but about like a rat running across the 
the, the rafters, has a piece of poison in its mouth. The poison affects it, it dies, it falls down into where they're grinding up the meat and the rats round up in there along with the poison. All right, then Taylor goes, takes a bite of a hot dog and gets a nice chunk of rat poisoning. Gets real sick, maybe even dies. Yeah, a little rat to go with it. That's just flavoring to go with the poison. But before Upton Sinclair wrote this book, the caveat in poor, well, you took the risk when you bought it. Do we have that philosophy today? No. In fact, we actually may have gone too far any other way. All right, I mean, we'll have people sue over anything today on it. But this is one that we directly have two laws, the Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act that were passed after Upton Sinclair wrote this book. Um, and that's why this book is one of the most important in American history. <laughs> All right, and that's where we're going to stop today. It wasn't too painful, was it? Yeah, we just passed it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, and... Kind of, this is where we were at before. The Meat Inspection Act, Pure Food and Drug Act. There aren't many times that we can look at a book or something that was written and say, here's a law directly from that. This is a case that we can look at it where when people read this book, they were upset. Teddy Roosevelt would use this to have bills introduced into Congress, and Congress would pass them all in one year. So that's why you kind of look and see for one writer, this one muckraker, a big difference that they made. Uh, all right, social gospel. If you remember back to the last section, not the gospel of wealth. This is not Andrew Carnegie. This is a social gospel with the idea that people had that for religious reasons, you should be, and this is where for some of you that know, for Christianity, it's supposed to be Christ-like. You're supposed to help out other people. Um, those of you that know things from the Bible, Jesus Christ would go and he associated with prostitutes. He associated with the poor and he was helping them out. And that's what a lot of Christianity is supposed to be seen as to be Christ-like. Well, the social gospel, if you see gospel, you should be thinking religious. Part of this was for a lot of mainly Protestants that they would go and help other people. Well, during this progressive movement, some of these effects were not only to help them out, but try to do things um, with law. Um, this, the idea of the, the settlement house workers, some of the main people doing this, though, they are white, middle-class women. A lot, of, a lot of your middle-class and richer women, they went to college. But if you're a proper woman, what are you supposed to do when you get older? Well, not really keep house, because actually if you have enough money and middle class at that time, you would have some, maybe a maid. <coughs> so if you have a maid and you cook, you're supposed to shop. You're supposed to shop, but do you want to do more than just shop? <coughs> so, well, yeah, you make babies. <laughs> all right, and that's part of what you're supposed to be as a, as a good woman, all right, and be a good mother, you were to make. But a lot of, lot of women, you weren't supposed to go and work. But you have now a college degree, especially in a lot of those social science fields. So this is where they got involved um, in these settlement houses. And, yeah, this, and that's why it, was, it wasn't just women, just not middle class, just not Protestant, but that's where the main leaders were. Um, the social science field, sociology, more of them getting involved in education, higher education, social work. Um, some of the key movements that they would be working in. The anti-monopoly movement. Why would women want to stop monopolies? So they can't do more. They can have money for their stuff. Well, money for stuff, but what did you say, Haley? So they get paid more. So they get paid. Well, they're not actually working so much. I mean, a lot of these women aren't. Are women sometimes a little bit more likely? I mean, this is stereotypical, but are they more likely to believe in fairness? Mm -hmm. And so this is part of the idea that, that you have, and the women want. I mean, it should be more fair. If you're a new business trying to start, where sometimes men were a little bit more likely to be a little bit more of the social Darwinistic idea, survival of the fittest. All right, that company's bigger and better, then all right. If you crush somebody, you didn't break any laws doing it, hey, that's fine. So maybe, maybe you have a little bit of that kind-hearted thing. Suffrage. Why would women want to have the right to vote? Because they're working for women. Like yeah, it doesn't make that sense, right? <laughs> this is, again, the idea of equality. 
uh, I mean, it's some of that fairness um, that we have. Because still, shouldn't a woman have the same rights as a man? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> aren't, you, aren't you part of the anti 19th Amendment society? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm sorry. But can suffrage just want to make sense? How about temperance? No drinking. All right, no drinking. Morals. All right, and that's where you said the religious. Those Protestant, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian. A lot of these Protestants were ones that they did not believe in alcohol. Did women probably see the effects a little bit more of the drunkenness that we had in America? Yes. And what you must realize, it's hard to imagine today when you turn on the TV and watch a sporting event and half the commercials are alcohol-based. We used to drink a lot more alcohol in the past in the United States than we do today. Okay, The, the average amount consumed by Americans in the early 1800s was more than double of what is consumed today by the average American. What about the <coughs> So, well, and this is where we have those immigrant groups coming in that are drinking a lot. So part of they would look and see for the temperance uh, movement. Part of that will have to do also with these immigrant groups. All right, the settlement house movement. What is the most famous settlement house that you should automatically see? Okay, the whole house. Founded by? Jane Adams. Jane Adams. This is where putting those SFIs together. Yes, that's trivial, but here's where I want you to be able to put that trivial part, Jane Adams finding the whole house. The whole house, or all settlement houses, the idea was to help out the disadvantaged, whether they be immigrants or not. Um, there, but to help out the poor. But as they are working together, do they end up making their own sort of government and bureaucracy inside the settlement house? This person's in charge of this. This person's in charge of that. Delegating authority and showing leadership. Well, if, a, if Jane Adams can run a giant organization like the whole house, shouldn't she be able to do a job in the city government? Doesn't she have experience in that now, dealing with budgets, dealing with fundraising, dealing with multiple people, multiple ideas? <coughs> and so this is where they gained a lot of a leadership roles in that way. Right, and this is a picture of Jane Adams. That is the whole house um, from the time period. All right, African Americans. I know this. I mean, this kind of keeps popping up. I had it in the Reconstruction part. I had it in the last last unit. Um, and it's not something that occurs in just one moment. We have Booker T. Washington. The idea of self help. What university does he found? Tuskegee. Yeah, the Tuskegee Institute, and it's more than just a, it's more than it's more than like a university. It's kind of like a technical school and university mixed together. Um, and the Atlanta Compromise that is where he he had made a statement, kind of accepting of segregation, but the idea that that for African Americans to help pull themselves up by their their bootstraps, and that whites will will give them more recognition if they are if they have skills that the whites need. Um, again, when we look at it today, it's, it seems derogatory, uh, but you have to put it at that time period when he says it in the 1890s. Um, he was actually progressed that time. Booker T. Washington is, is, was one of the most respected African American leaders that today we don't have as much for him. Uh, those of you that went to Inverness Middle School, okay, what was it? Yeah, it was the Booker T. Washington School when it was the, the when we had segregated schools and Citrus County. So that kind of tells you where the respect that the black community here in Citrus County had um, for Booker T. Washington when they named their school after him. All right, the boys pushing for civil rights, uh, the Niagara Movement, which would lead to the NAACP. Uh, I know I spoke a little bit of that yesterday. And this would keep advancing throughout the early 1900s. All right, now I'm going to jump a little bit ahead. Here's a name, some of you might remember from the people quizzes, those of you that are, are new, you probably haven't heard of Marcus Garvey. Um, a lot of times people will think of it as, as the idea of the Back to Africa movement. In the 1920s, and this was a international movement, not just in the United States, uh, Marcus Garvey, put a picture of him. Uh, but this is where Marcus Garvey was actually from Jamaica, 
and he was pushing that, that in Africa that there should be independent nations and that whether it be in the blacks from the United States or from the Caribbean, that their ancestors had been brought over as slaves, they, that they'd be able to go and have their own nation, a black nationalism um, in Africa. Um, there, but some of this idea is, is are coming about in the progressive movement, and part of that was the frustration that there hadn't been advancements being made. <coughs> okay, and I you know, come, go ahead. This is one that I it, just because it happens in this time period. Um, Ginn versus the United States made the grandfather clause illegal. What was the grandfather clause? <laughs> yeah, if your grandfather couldn't vote, you couldn't vote. So grandfather was a slave, could he vote? No, then you're not allowed to vote. They didn't say you couldn't vote, they just basically had. Or? What if you were, then they, what if you became a grandfather? Could you? No, if you still weren't able, that was the whole idea of it. So what we did. And, and <laughs> you also have to realize in the, in the South, not just for, for blacks, because in some cases, if your father was a poor white farmer, may not have been given the, the right to vote. So they was keeping the power in the South with the, the old planter class. Um, it, again, not just with blacks, but it was named mainly, mainly for um, African Americans that they wouldn't be able to. But the Supreme Court declared that that was illegal around the turn of the century. Um, that's not one of those top cases to remember. If you could happen to remember that case, then you've got a better memory than me with trivial. Um, some of you kind of remember that. But, this is where, where the, the idea that I want you to remember is, this is where we are making some progress and we're getting rid of some of the things of segregation and some of these laws that, have been, that were being made to stop. All right. This is what I want you to, to go and get used to this term. What is a wasp? Not a bug. When you sometimes will see the term wasp, what does that stand for? It's white Anglo Saxon Protestant. White Anglo Saxon Protestant. All right, y'all know what white is. What is Anglo Saxon? It's American. It's not from Europe. It's not American. It's, well, German. Yeah, it's an ethnic group, and basically it is Europe and it's Western Europe. If you want to put it in some ways, when we had the new immigrants and old immigrants, these are the old immigrants. And then for Protestants. Now, mentioned about, a lot of the settlement house was done by Protestant white women. Are these same women fighting much when it comes time for civil rights for African Americans? Yeah, they're not fighting a whole lot for us. In fact, and this is where we kind of get a little time period before this when we when we have Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was writing and then upset that African men got the right to vote vote when women didn't. Okay, so you sometimes I mean even have have it on the other extreme um, there. But we're going to see Wasps when we get to the 1920s because we're going to have a rebirth of the KKK. And the rebirth of the KKK may not be all in places that you are assuming it will be. Okay? And so that's why, it is, again, this is kind of a segue in between one section of time to another. And I have a question, was the progressive movement actually bad for African Americans? Well, they, no, African men already had the right to vote. They are before. It's kind of like they were getting there. They were getting to equality. And realistically, and this is where you kind of look at an APSA, this is where you can write and support it either way. You have the Niagara Movement. You have the NAACP. There's a bunch. Uh, you have those things that are making movements. But at the same time, while other groups, the settlement houses are working for immigrant groups, the African Americans kind of be in, are in the same place. You can actually even make the argument on the other side, and we, and we will start looking a little bit at, at some of the presidents and what they did, but Woodrow Wilson, who was seen as one of the progressive presidents, would actually issue an executive order which would segregate all United States buildings. So this is where our president 
who did a lot for advancement for women, the right to vote, was seen as one of our most progressive presidents, would turn around and made it where it wasn't just segregated in the South, it was segregated in other U.S. buildings. What did that accomplish? Well, what was the point of it? And this is where you look at it and say, is that very progressive? It really, I mean, if you look at it, it's actually a backward step um, where, where it wasn't just in the South. Right. He, he could have been doing it to keep like peace though between the white and, and, and the And this is where, and I'm, I'm got, and this is where for, and later on when we start looking at this a little deeper, some people will look at things and say that some of the movements made in the progressive movement was actually to water down some of the gains that African Americans have made. Woodrow Wilson was from Virginia. Um, and you see some things with what Woodrow Wilson wrote. And he was a very good president, a lot of things he did, but you could tell from that time period, a lot of his writings that he was racist um, in his viewpoint. And it is kind of the social Darwin idea of one race being superior to another. Some people will go and make a thesis that giving women the right to vote actually then waters down the black male's vote. Because in the South, if you end up having more women able to vote, especially if you have barriers for blacks not to vote, then you're going to have have more whites voting. So that's part of what some of the arguments that, that were made. The 17th Amendment, which this will be in a section we'll have later on this week, but that will make it where senators are directly elected. No longer states choosing it on there. So people will point to that 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 was a way, if you have it where, especially in southern states, then there is no way that a, a black was going to win a southern election um, for Senate, and especially with the way the rules were made in there. So there are things you can point to it um, and, and see. And this is where I kind of do a little bit higher thinking at, um, when we start putting all this together afterwards. All right, now we get to the suffrage movement. I have to find a video that we have where a person goes around and, and goes to different high, sc high school students and say to sign a petition and have all these girls that are signing a petition to end women's suffrage. Um, I have to show it, show it to you. There's various ones. There's one that I, that I know I've seen that's pretty funny because you have, they have don't videotape these girls and they're given a, a speech that they're signing about how suffrage is so bad and women are suffering. Um, there. But, Suffrage is the right to vote. Now, the background, it wasn't something that occurred, but we go back. Seneca Falls Convention, they wrote the Declaration of, of Sentiments back in the 1840s. But at that time, the leading women, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, um, the Grimke sisters, they then focused in on helping to end slavery. Um, Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison was, were giving them, giving them um, the promise that they would help them after they ended slavery. Later on, I mean, it, we kind of torch would be passed from Elizabeth K. Stanton to Susan B. Anthony, because Susan B. Anthony got arrested multiple times for for voting. Um, we would have women's universities that would be established. We have the Settlements House movement that's given on leadership, and we will have it out west. Women were given the right to vote. Wyoming was our first state. I think sometimes in the late 1870s. Why were Western states giving women the right to vote? They didn't have a lot of people out there. Well, they didn't have a lot of people, but why does it matter? Rhode Island doesn't have a lot of people. So Rhode Island wasn't going to give their women the right to vote. They gave them a reward for living so solitary lives. Okay, and that's was it easy to go out on the Great Plains as a woman and live on these homesteads? And so it was, you had to be a pretty tough woman to go out and live out west. And that was kind of, it was a reward. Also, were there as many women out west in percentage of the population as there were for men compared to east? So it, it may not have been a threat to some of the men, but the main thing was is that women had got that right. All right, National American Suffrage Association. Uh, um, you do not have to go and memorize this type of group, but when you see suffrage and see women together, I hope you know what it's fine for. One of the main women that will then take the torch from Susan B. Anthony will be Carrie Chapman Catt. And where Susan B. Anthony ran a lot of that race that was started by Elizabeth Cady State and other women, Catt would kind of get it to the finish line and give it where women would get the right to vote. 
We would then also have another party that would be fighting for us, the National Women's Party. The leader there is Alice Paul. The thing is for Alice Paul, she wasn't fighting just for the right for women to vote. She was pushing for the ERA. Now what does ERA stand for? Equal Rights Amendment. Right, the Equal Rights Amendment. One an amendment to the Constitution saying that men and women are equal. Actually had a pretty good amount of support in the early 1920s, but by the time the Great Depression comes around, that was not in the forefront. It would come back again in the feminist movement, but would never be voted on and passed in the 1970s and 60s when it was pushed through again. But Alice Paul, uh, this is woman, you remember, you need to remember what's that. Now, the 19th Amendment made it where women got the right to vote. I have the question, how did women end up voting? A lot of men were really scared that women would make up their own party. Yeah. Because, now, men were worried. We have Republicans, Democrats, and if we have a women's party, who would end up controlling government? Yeah, women. So a lot of men were really scared about that. What ended up happening, though, in 1920, when women were given the right to vote in their first presidential election? Yeah, most of the time, whatever their family was from, their husband or their father, they ended up voting kind of the same way their family had. Um, and government is a term we call, it's called political socialization. Basically, where do you get your political ideas? The main thing you get it from, more than anything else, is your family. All right, those of you that are more conservative or more liberal, all right, most of that that you get is from your family. Um, so, and that's what ended up happening for these women. So, it, they didn't have their own party. Some voted Democrat, some voted Republican. And we continued on with the same party system that we have. All right, we're going to stop there. It's about the suffrage uh, movement. Here's where you, you, you just, you need to know names. Um, that's where the people pushed before I have some of these um, that, that we have. But you just need to know when you see Pat, when you see Paul, if you're thinking of what, you got to place it in the, in the right time period um, that, that you have here. And the 19th Amendment, again, that is the amendment that, that made the change that gave women the right to vote. Now, labor changes. Just saw that video with Triangle Shortways Factory. Here's where unions were pushing for these changes. Do you think that it helped that not only was it a lot of people that died, but there were a lot of young women? Well, like for the cause it helped. Yeah, I mean it does. I mean, it's if it would have been a bunch of old immigrant men, do you think there would have been much uproar? But if it is a lot of teenage girls, all right, they have their whole life ahead of them. Okay, and here what? Uh, they had some of the door, doors locked, locked so that the women wouldn't go out, other exits. The, why did they say that they had it for a narrow entrance? So they couldn't yeah. steal the bag. Yeah, they couldn't steal it. So basically when they were going out, they could basically check their bags. Uh, that's why some of the exits were, were locked up. Okay, make sure that they were working and working full time um, there. So that's, but we would have these safety fi features. And like I said, a lot of the city features that, that were done at that time were pushed up about. All right, Taylorism, the idea of scientific management. We had this in our last unit. Um, be familiar with the word. The idea there is to be efficient. Uh, most of you will think of things of the assembly line, and this is where Henry Ford comes in. How did he change the building of cars? Made it quicker, easier, okay. cheaper. Quicker, easier, which made it then cheaper. Uh, there. Do you have to have as much skill in order to work on his assembly line? No. no. You're going to do the same thing over and over again. And you, when you have studies like this for Taylorism, scientific man, they will study and make sure where do you push it. Um, where do you put certain things? You may not think of it, but if you have something and it's a difference of you kind of stepping and making one thing that you have to go and grab. Oh, it takes you an extra 1.3 seconds to do that. But if you have to do that a couple hundred times during the day, 
how much time do you have if you move that closer where you don't have to, that 1.3 seconds. <laughs> and that's where they would actually study and try to find anything. Um, here's where the last unit comes into to play also. The idea that we have of the science coming in and the studying of things. They're going to study every little aspect. Remember, this is the time that Charles Darwin as his philosophies are, are coming about. So people are looking at things in more of a scientific method. Okay? How can we make it more efficient? And that's all that Taylorism is. Um, no chat. All right, child labor. Lady that you need to know with here who was involved in the union was Mother Jones. Or Mary Jones is her real name, but she was known as Mother Jones. I always think it's easy to remember her with child labor because when you think of our Mother Jones, she's fighting to try to end child labor. Why? Child labor is bad. She likes kids. Okay, and here's where you have to think different. Yes, child labor is bad. Let's say that again. She's a labor union leader. Does she want competition for the people she's representing in her union? Yeah. Why did factories like hiring little children? Cheaper. They're cheaper. Plus, they have little hands sometimes to get in little places. And you'll see a lot of pictures. Like, this is a famous picture you'll see over and over again. But you'll see a lot of pictures of some of the child labor all the time. Were these children in the labor unions as well or not? See, most of the time, they try, the, the elders tried not to have them in the... And most of them were poor immigrant children. How old were they? Like Some, sometimes you would have four or five year old kids. Uh, and again, sometimes you would hire them because they were small and they could crawl into little places and get into stuff that you couldn't hire a bigger person. But they're cheaper. Um, and I'm not saying that Mother Jones was doing this all in self interest, but that's where you, you've got to have this connection with the unions. It's not just. Oh, look at these poor children. We need to put them in school. Now, if you also want to look on a self-interest aspect of this, if a lot of these are immigrant kids, the mandatory schooling. Why do we want to make sure that we're putting these immigrant children in school? Yeah, yeah. Americanize them. Yeah, Americanize them. We want to teach them to be American. Okay. And it's the same, the nativism that, that, you, that you'll see today. I mean, it's how are you going to get it where you are more like Americans and not by your home co country? And that's, that was part of the idea of it. Now, a bill that you need to know, and this will be in one of our events, is the Keating Owen, Owen Act. It was passed in 1916. It would outlaw child labor. The Supreme Court would say, it's illegal. So with judicial review, it goes away. So the Supreme Court's in favor of kids working. Why did the Supreme Court knock it down? And basically that's kind of the idea that you have in the, the 14th Amendment. Uh, later on, though, and this is why I... Even though the law was overturned, after that, the law itself was overturned, but most of the pieces of the idea of it were put in other laws, just in smaller ways. And, this, and what happens with the Supreme Court is a lot of times they'll declare something unconstitutional, but when, they, when the justice is right about it, they say, it's unconstitutional because of this. And they're basically instructing Congress, here's how you need to write the law to make it legal. Um, and most of those things were later on put in place, especially during the Great Depression. A lot of the, a lot of the child labor laws were put there. But no, even though it was overturned, you need to know the Keating Owen Act. All right, temperance. What does temperance mean? No drinking. Yeah, no alcohol. Starting a long time before we get to the progressive movement, it keeps gaining power. Keeps gaining gaining power. Um, and the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, be familiar with that, WCTU, because you're going you're gonna to see the various writings. As soon as you see that, the thing, right, these are the people that want to get rid of, um, with, or get rid of the alcohol. Now, the main leader that is kind of known in history is, is Francis Willard. I know that a lot of you like Carrie Nation. 
Okay. How did she? How did Carrie Nation make a make she a difference? Actually, she was a bar. And those of you who don't know Carrie Nation, she is a little grandmotherly looking type woman that did did not like the idea of alcohol. And her and some other older women would come into a bar, and she and this is where kind of knowing how to use the press and the idea of it of it there. And she carried her her hatchet with her, but it's like what. Um, I'm not sure if she went to jail for things or not with it, but this is where she was. She believed in the cause. Um, now, Frances Willard, what the, the WCTU did was fight to legally get it out of And the 18th Amendment was passed and added to the Constitution. We made 27 amendments to our Constitution. One of them is the 18th Amendment that outlawed alcohol. Now, when we get to the 1920s, I'm actually going to go more into, because that's the Prohibition period, why it is that they were what worked, what didn't, why do we ultimately have the 21st Amendment that repeals it. Um, now, what you need to know as AP students, the Volstead Act, put stars, if you have a highlighter, highlight that there, put arrows to it. If you are ever writing about prohibition, they, it's expected that you kind of know that the 18th Amendment outlawed alcohol. The Volstead Act, though, is what you need to know. And when you see that, you ought to automatically be thinking prohibition. Not only does it outlaw alcohol, but it gives it the punishments. So that is where it's, I know I know it's one of those things that you kind of look at things and, and say, all right, well, in the whole scheme of things, it's not real important. But this is one of those details that when it comes down for tests, that they're not going to put the 18th Amendment when they have something there for prohibition. They're going to have the Volstead Act. So you need to automatically be thinking that. Depending on what, how much you had, what you were doing, but it, but it was, but it was all things that made it where it enforced that. Um, the why approved? When we're going to go that when we get to the prohibition part in there. What it was that made it where so many people supported this. This was not something that a small number of people in America said. Let's push this on everybody else. Right. This was something in which a large majority of Americans said, we need to have this where we totally outlaw alcohol. Um, but here's where also a tie-in. Notice I keep making this tie. Any aspect towards immigrants? Yeah, a lot of our new immigrants, the Italians, Greek, all right, we're known for drinking a little bit more. So there would be something to focus on. If, if the majority of the people that didn't like it were like Protestant, does that mean, so like every, like, there are that many Protestants in America? Yes. So that's like. The Catholic Church was growing a lot, but who were most of, most of our Catholics at this time period? Not, no, no, no. This it makes half women and half men. Immigrants. What are some European, oh, Italian, Ita no. Italian? No. the Irish, which now the Irish are no longer the new immigrants, but Spanish. are the Irish really fully in power by the time we get to progressive era? No. So this is where, but, but a lot of our new immigrants are, are Catholic. Meanwhile, the group that is in power okay, were a lot of those older Protestants, the WASP that we talked about the other day um, in here. And this is where we kind of look at a change. Um, did, did I sh show, show you all that one clip from John Stewart? No. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, I thought, I thought yeah, yeah, yeah. that. So. But this is where, where John Stewart was kind of talking about one group. And people don't like to give up their power, but that's what kind of America has been. Is one group and another group comes to replace them. And the group that was before is fighting, fighting that off as long as possible. That's the end of the notes for today.